This ship will self-destruct in exactly 10 seconds. <laughs> Counting down. 10, 9, 8, 6. 6? What happened to 7? Just kidding. <laughs> Porter. Hey, <laughs> hey, Anna Sarid. I was taking a drink. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Dirty trickster. <laughs> I can't help but notice that we sound really different. Do you know why? Uh, I think I do, but maybe we should explain. <laughs> We're on location. We're traveling hoes. That's what the most famous podcasters do, <laughs> right? We will tell you where we're at next episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But so right now, it's a surprise. Yeah, so we're on location for this one. Stay tuned for next week. Welcome to Split Happens. Welcome, everybody. Each episode, Katrina and I are going to discuss a movie we both personally, truly love, except only one of us, the pro, is allowed to defend how good it is, while the other, the con, mm-hmm. has to attack it. For example, I am the pro today. And Katrina? I am going to... Barf all over this movie. Oh, <laughs> like, like, barf. Exactly. <laughs> we have three simple rules here at Split Happens. We've got rules around here. <laughs> Rule number one, whoever claims pro on a movie we haven't covered yet gets it. Rule number two, the con does not have to attack until the synopsis starts. And rule number three, during that time, the con can't say anything nice about the movie. Now, yeah, a few people have pointed out to us <laughs> that we've been breaking that last rule a bit. What? <laughs> Liars? What? So anytime rule number three is broken from here on out, the offender has to say a good thing about a specific movie that we despise. We have already chosen our hated movies. Mm-hmm. I would say mine is the remake of Clash of the Titans. And mine is the movie Hannibal, not the TV show, which is great. Oh, that one was great. Yeah. That, it shouldn't even be called a movie Hannibal. You really hated it. I hate it so much. We added a button so that you will know when the rule has been broken. I'm in a glass case of emotion. I am in a glass case of emotion. (laughs) Every time I have to attack one of these movies, I hate it. As we know, because of Katrina's, uh, she already said that she was going to attack this movie, we are doing Spaceballs. We're going to be releasing this on May the 4th, Mm. which is Star Wars Day, as everybody knows, or should know. And rather than uh, review a Star Wars movie, we're going to do the parody of Star Wars. Yeah, we are. Because it's awesome. Yeah, that's my disclaimer. Oh, what's your disclaimer? My notes are garbage. Ooh. I... This movie is so good. I really love it. I, I've i seen this movie a million times. I watched this movie three times <laughs> to make my notes. Was that because my son was with you? No, because I was trying to come up with stuff to attack. Man, our button's going to get some good use today. No, no. I'm not going to say anything good about it once we start. You're going to be saying something good about Hannibal. Fuck off. <laughs> Okay, so this movie came out in 1987. Mm -hmm. This movie was directed by Mel Brooks. He said that he had already kind of covered other genres, the Westerns. He had parodied horror movies with Young Frankenstein. He had went after film noir with Double Anemone. Did I just say that right? (laughs) Double Anemone? Oh, shit. I'm going to have to have a disclaimer. Uh, Yeah, you do need one. Okay, so normally we go to everybody knows we go to Acapulco and have margaritas we get some margs but we're on location so I couldn't do that this time no so so, but you did I did yeah you had a marg I had a delicious other drink called calamocho which is sangria and coca-cola it is fucking delicious it looked really good it is so tasty it sounds like it won't work and it definitely does the job like this podcast the the calamocho has hit me pretty good 
Yeah, it is. So this movie was directed by Mel Brooks. He said that he had covered all of those other genres. And the only thing he hadn't covered yet was space. I'll go over like the cast of this. Okay. Like as we go along. Okay, that's fun. The budget for this movie was $22.7 million. And the box office was 38.1. Ooh. So it did make a profit, just not like huge. This yeah. is another one of those movies that like gain a following through you know vhs home video the kids don't know what vhs is on there do they know what dvds are maybe um vhs was blu-ray but with ribbon (laughs) (laughs) spaceballs was the most expensive film brooks would ever produce uh he came close to it with dracula dead and loving it to put that into perspective, um, in 1967, his first film, The Producers, cost less than a million to make. I forgot that The Producers was his. Yeah. That's a great one. The plot of Spaceballs was inspired by uh, Frank Capra's classic, It Happened One Night. What? Yeah. Uh, it's the story of a runaway heiress mm-hmm. who escapes her marriage by fleeing on her wedding day from a very, very rich but super dull groom and then she falls in love with an attractive wise guy commoner okay and Mel Brooks specifically said that that's what this he said we took the same basic plot and shoved it into space in okay did you ever watch history of the world part one yes at the very end of that the joke of the movie is that the sequel would be titled Jews in space and he originally planned to call it planet moron um, but he learned that there was already a British science fiction spoof called Morons from Outer Space. So then he and his um, like production team were sitting around and they were like trying to find another word to add to space. And as they were doing that, um, Mel Brooks accidentally spilled his drink and he went, balls! <laughs> and they were like, yeah, that! All right, that's all of the pre-movie trivia I have. Do you have anything to say before we get into synopsis? I mean, I love this movie. I have nothing bad to say about John Candy, even if he were alive. Um, because he's perfect and I love him and I love this movie. So get ready for some garbage. This is going to be bad. It's going to be bad. I can tell already. I know. Is it because I normally have 12 pages of notes and I have two pages? Do you just have two pages? (gasps) Oh no. I don't even have anything in the captions. And that's kind of like large writing for you too. I I was like. It doesn't look psychotic at all. Dear diary, I killed four people today. (laughs) I don't feel a thing. (laughs) Let's go ahead and play the song and fly in. Let the games begin. All right, we get our title scroll and a gigantic ship. A gigantic ship? Yeah, it's a huge ship. It's an excessively large, I have no penis size ship. Yeah, that was the point. They're like, the the Star Wars one was, you know, stupidly big. So they're like, we can go bigger. I Okay, to put this in perspective, I was watching this when I was first taking my notes with my almost eight-year-old nephew, and even he was like, is this ship ever going to end? <laughs> Did he really yeah. say that? He's like, this is, this is too much. Mel Brooks, I watched a documentary on, like, the making of this, and he kept saying how this movie was meant for kids. He said that several times, and I'm like, Really? Um, okay, I have another con. Oh, no. <laughs> Is it about the profanity? Well, and there was like the scene with the twins. And oh, the... yeah. I shouldn't say anything about this because I did watch this with my eight-year-old nephew. Oh, yeah. 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 This movie's fine for kids. Uh, the first person we see is Colonel Sanders. What a stupid fucking name. Colonel Sanders. And it's spelled S-A-N-D-U-R-Z. D-U-M-B. Played by George Weiner. He's a character actor. He's in a billion different movies. It's a Weiner, right? The original actor selected for the role of Colonel Sanders was Steve Martin. How many times are you going to say, wait, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. It was, it was, the, the part was written for Steve Martin. And then was Steve Martin like, this is a stupid fucking name. I'm not going to do it. He had a billion other projects he was doing. He didn't have time. So they brought in George Weiner and, you know... He did a great job, but if you go back and watch it, like the next time you watch it, because I'm sure you're going to watch it again, it is very Steve Martin-esque. And then next we see Dark Helmet, and he is played by Rick Moranis. Okay. I've got something to say. Already? Yeah. Okay. And this is a legitimate question. Ooh. What asshole would make Rick Moranis the bad guy? 
He wanted to play the asshole. No, I don't think that's true. He actually helped write quite a bit of this. A lot there's a lot of improv going on and I'll get into you know Princess Vespa later, but she specifically said that Mel Brooks and Rick Moranis did a lot of the writing. Actually, I'll get into Mel Brooks has said some things about Rick Moranis that yeah, that are not nice. It's not that. He just kind of he I think he said it's not that he said he was a pain in the ass, just that he was, he would want to, he'd shoot a scene and he's like, okay, let's go ahead and do it again, but we'll do it this way. And he would keep changing, he, he wanted more and more and more because he wanted to get it right. And Mel Brooks as a director was like, this is getting out of hand. And he, and, but Mel Brooks was like, but he was always right. And it was so annoying. Though what asshole would make Rick Moranis the bad guy is my only good take. So you can't shoot it down that easily. Rick Moranis was kind of a dickhead in Parenthood with uh, with Steve Martin. Ooh, circle, circular. He was complicated in Parenthood, and he came around. He had, why do birds suddenly appear every time? Every time. You are near. You are near. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> well, in this, he's a dick. Just like <laughs> they long to me. Do you want to eat any more? to you uh, oh. Go, oh, oh fuck that was so loud i'm gonna edit how loud that was but dude my fucking ear is bleeding <laughs> i'm bleeding now are you happy i just love that part from parenthood i can tell <laughs> i can tell what okay so dark helmet obviously is based on darth vader i'm gonna try really hard not to call him darth helmet it might happen i think every time you say darth instead of dark you have to say something nice about the remake of clash of the titans fuck you <laughs> i'm not doing that i mean we we messed up a lot of the names in suicide squad it, it, so I, that was kind of you to say we i messed up a lot of names. <laughs> <laughs> i agreed with all of them so you know we're both there uh okay so his wardrobe is kind of hilarious dark helmet uh he has like the gigantic helmet and also the tie and shorts over tights. The visor, he kept putting the visor down, which was great for him because he would laugh his ass off like in the middle of takes. And George Weiner was like, that's not fair. He gets to just like put in the visor down and we all have to try and keep a straight face. And you could just see his like little shoulders, like, you know, moving up and down because he was laughing. Uh, Moranis also... Uh, was the one that suggested that John Candy be in this movie. Oh, I know. So the Spaceballs, that's what they are known as. The ship itself is called the Spaceballs 1. Their planet is called Spaceballs, Planet Spaceballs, and they are Spaceballs. Lazy. They do the it's not lazy. They make it super easy for you to remember everything. Yeah, what do we call all of our socials? Split Heaven's Pod? Because <laughs> we're <laughs> fucking lazy. Right. No, we just want to make it easy. We don't want to make things complicated. Spaceballs, across the board. Split Heaven's Pod, across the board. Uh, tweet us, or uh, don't forget to go on iTunes and rate us five stars. Oh, please. Yeah, <laughs> give, us, give, us a, give, give, us some, give us some words. Uh, nice words. Nice ones. Preferably. And follow us on Spotify. Anyway, so they're headed for planet Druidia. What a stupid name. Druidia. So they can ransom her so that her father, King Roland, will give them the combination for the air shield so they can steal their air to save planet Spaceball. They just want to save their own planet. Princess Vespa? Uh-huh. What a stupid name. Uh, it's not a stupid name. Oh, really? It's easy to remember. Princess Vespa? Yeah. Yeah. That's not worse than Leia. <gasps> Prince Leia, Vespa. I mean, it's, it's, that's not, I'm not looking at your dog. I like when we got back from the restaurant and she was just staring at the wall. <laughs> yeah. For God knows how long. <laughs> well, they are trying to steal the air to save Planet Spaceball. And we know that because Colonel Sanders says everything. And then Dark Helmet's like, everybody got that? And it's just one of many times where they break the fourth wall. Which I love. I love when when movies break the fourth wall. I know not everybody's into that, but I really like it. Deadpool. Other movies. <laughs> <laughs> On Planet Druidia, we 
Did I say that right? Druidia. 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 We meet Princess Vespa. Dumb name. Who is played by Daphne Siniga. And Dot Matrix, who is voiced by Joan Rivers. R.I.P. Yeah, R.I.P. Wait, this movie's cursed. Boo. <laughs> uh, just two people, right? No, like five. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Who else besides John Candy and Joan Rivers? Well, isn't Bill Pullman dead? No. Oh, that's Bill Paxton. Oh. No, three of the um, little guys died in the making of this. That's not true. <laughs> you swore you weren't going to prank me. I you, I knew it. God damn it. That was just, I, this is why I feel unsafe constantly constantly listen you forced me into lying by i I, (laughs) knew you were gonna do it you're like i promise i promise i'm like i feel like you're lying to me you're 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 giving me a false sense of security and you're like no 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 i promise listen i had every intention of not pranking you and then you made me say how many people died on this movie and i had to come up with something this is your fault you need to take accountability victim blaming what kind of social worker are you great one oh yeah you are Daphne Zuniga plays Princess Vespa. She was really, really new to this. She was cast because Mel Brooks wanted somebody that could play that straight role. They needed somebody that was able to have that dramatic acting. She said that she has such a hard time keeping a straight face, like constantly through this, especially around John Candy. He mm-hmm. just was kind of known to, he just really, really liked a happy set. He liked people to be happy. He was, he was, he didn't complain. She was like, you've got to stop because I try. I have to, I actually have to keep a straight face. So that was kind of unfortunate. So she's a complainer too. Uh, two? Who else was a complainer? You're talking about George Weiner? Weiner. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. <laughs> Joan Rivers. She's the voice of Dot. She actually came in at the very end. The, the person that's in the costume was, uh, she's a mime. It's uh, Loreen... Jansen and she was going to do all of the voiceover stuff as well but she just didn't have the right comedic voice for it so then they brought in Joan Rivers after the fact and she helped write some of the jokes and stuff like that for for Dot but Lorraine Jansen was in that costume in in the desert scene specifically like they were like she it must have been 120 degrees in that costume she was so hot and they would have to keep lifting up her mask during like in between takes just so she could breathe well and they said she lost like a bunch of weight which she was thin to begin with so yeah it was it was a really difficult thing and she was a pro she really yeah so mel brooks doesn't care about his actors (laughs) he he gave her some air (laughs) he put out a bowl of water and some (laughs) food (laughs) he didn't make her do the voiceover stuff too you mean the voiceover stuff that's done in a nice climate controlled studio yeah he knew that joan rivers was having health problems and he didn't want her to be in the costume okay joan rivers was not having health problems in 1987 we don't know that yes we do do we yes it was in the national Enquirer. joan rivers perfectly healthy <laughs> <laughs> you know, holy shit a total of six outfits were made for jansen but they were all worn out and broken on the set Shoot that poor woman. Yeah, she really put in the she work. She probably got paid a thousand dollars. We see Princess Vespa, and she's a spoiled bitchy princess. Oh my God, is she ever bridezilla? Am I right? Yeah, she does a good job of this. Well, she doesn't want to be forced into marriage with the oh, supposedly the only prince. Oh, we'll get to in that. the galaxy. But I'm just curious, not to quote wedding singer again. But isn't this a conversation that would have been more useful yesterday? Maybe she was having that and we just didn't see it. She's been like trying to say and they've just been ignoring her. And they're like, you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. So then she has to do it. and But then she does it because she runaway brides it. Uh, Follow up question. Yo. In what scene in this movie where King Roland is in, yeah. does it look like he puts his foot down ever? Um, Are you th- telling me that she couldn't get this guy to do what she wanted? Um, I mean, he is the king. He's he's he has to put his foot down occasionally. I bet he does with her. We just never see it in this movie, okay. right? Because okay. it'd be boring. Okay. And this is a comedy, so we don't get to see it. Mm-hmm. Just then, 
Mm. We get Lone Star, our male lead, who is played by Bill Pullman, and Barf, who is John Candy, who is kind of a parody of Chewbacca. And they are in a space Winnebago. And they're listening to Bon Jovi. And that's rad. Listen, neither one of them are very responsible pilots. What are you talking about? They pilot really well. He pilots especially good at the end. Mm-mm. He's the one's asleep, one's eating Scooby snacks. It was on autopilot. They're just traveling through space. They don't need to have. <laughs> They're just traveling through space. The the Winnie can like take it. It can it can auto drive. Mm. It is the future after all. Yeah, this looks like the future. Is it the future? Because in, in, in Star Wars, it's like a long time ago. It's the future. That's all that matters. We learn that they owe a character called Pizza the Hut. Haunts which, my dreams. <laughs> it's a parody of Jabba the Hut. They owe him a whole bunch of money and he wants it like nowsies. Pizza the Hut's disgusting. Yeah. The metallic guy starts eating Pizza the Hut. Yes. Which was terrifying. Yes. I didn't love that when I was a kid. That one really stuck out with me. Well, yeah, because it's fucking weird. The voice of Pizza the Hut is Dom DeLuise, which I didn't realize. Oh, I didn't either. Yeah, I've, God, I hope people know who that is. What asshole wasted Dom DeLuise in this role? Well, uh, what do you mean? Like not putting him in the costume or? Oh, yeah, you didn't even know it's Dom DeLuise. I, I love him. He, if anybody doesn't know who he is, he did a bunch of movies with Burt Reynolds um, Cannonball Run and stuff like that. But he was also the voice in the tons of like Don Bluth movies. Like American Tale, which you know I love. Fine. Fievel. Okay, we're not going to get into what you did to Fievel. Okay? Don't say it like that. There was nothing untoward done to Fievel. Really? You didn't cut his hat off and then call him Bald Boy? <laughs> that was my favorite toy. I loved him. And you defiled him. So... I hope now you can sleep. You can't leave the bald boy thing in. <laughs> That's terrible. This is like when you pushed me into that dollhouse. Oh anyway, my anyway. god. Well, he's the voice of Piece of the Hut, but a different actor was in the costume. Just like Dot Matrix, but it's because um, Dom DeLuise wouldn't wear it, which was smart because the actor that did wear the costume ended up with second and third degree burns because they wanted to use actual like hot cheese and sauce and pizza ingredients so it would look more realistic. Mel Brooks is awful. Yeah, he's, he's savage. He wants a good movie. God. People were willing to, to do what was necessary. And not Tom DeLuise. He's in Blazing Saddles, too. We're he, not doing Blazing Saddles. I know. I wish. No, can't do it. No, I just watched it the other day, and it, that confirmed. We mm -hmm. cannot, but I laughed my ass off. <laughs> There are so many bad puns in this movie. Yeah, you know, that's Mel Brooks. He's just, he's very, he's a pun heavy type of guy. Barf is played by John Candy. And again, like I said, Rick Moranis suggested John Candy because they were in SCTV together. Also with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. Oh, Shit's Creek. Yeah. Uh, the original look for Barf was that he was going to be like, have like a full face like bulldog. But when he was cast in the role, Mel Brooks was like, it's, he's like, I've got, he's like, if we're going to hide John Candy behind a mask, he might as well hire somebody else for half the price. He's like, we paid for John Candy. We should actually be able to see his great face. The look of Barf was definitely simplified. However, it took three people to operate it because John Candy would actually be able to move the tail with like a hidden control in his paw. But two other crew members would control the ear, his ears off camera. And the entire contraption was powered by a 30-pound battery that John Candy had to wear on his back. Go ahead, say it, you evil bitch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> what happened there? Do you think that's what killed him? <laughs> that's what gave him the heart attack? Yeah. The heart attack, a -a 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 <laughs> From that battery, pa 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 John Candy was a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> not that it matters at this point but john candy added, he uh, improvised the line that oh that's gonna leave a mark let's talk about lone star real quick talk about bill pullman i have in my notes r.i.p bill pullman no fucking way he's not dead i have r.i.p all through my notes <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell <laughs>
the way they casted Lodestar, uh, Bill Pullman was pretty much unknown. And he wasn't the first choice for it. They uh, had asked both Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks, and they turned it down. Oh. I know. Bill Pullman had only been in one other movie before this. What was it? Ruthless People. So, yes, yeah, so this was Spaceballs is only his second movie. I've got nothing to say. Oh, Tom Berenger was also like considered for this. Interesting. I think he would have been good. Uh, his first choice was actually James Caan. I just watched The Godfather the other night again for the millionth time. Right. It's so great. Is it because you're watching that show on The it, Offer? Oh. The Offer on Paramount Plus. Okay, I'm going to have to watch it's that one. It's really good. Well, he wanted James Caan, and I think he would have been really, really great. Intense, but really, really great. But he was um, going through some... He was battling addiction at the time. Oh. So you had to get that figured out. This would have... 87 would have been... I wonder when Misery came out. Ooh, 89 maybe? So, yeah, 80s. A little bit late, uh-huh. for sure. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I wonder if he took that because Misery was like basically about Stephen King's cocaine addiction. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Over in Spaceball City, we meet President Scroob. That's S-K-R-O-O-B. These names, I cannot. Scroob is an, um, an anagram for Brooks. Oh. I know. I didn't know it until I saw it. And I was like, oh. It was because it's played by director Mel Brooks. He, he does a dual role in this. He is behind the plot to kidnap Vespa, but luckily Lone Star is able to save the princess by jamming the radar with okay, but- actual jam. Wait, 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 wait. What isn't this where they like were snotty instead of Scotty beams him down? <laughs> he beat me up twice last night. It was wonderful. I mean, it was <laughs> that's so dumb. Okay, it was not for kids. Right. And what's what's with the two blondes? Uh I'm Marlene. I'm Charlene. Yeah. What's the point of them? Titties make people laugh. I know, but why do they have to like it really weirds me out when they have like a threesome and two of the people are sisters. Yeah, I don't love it. No. I don't even love that we're talking about it. I'm going to forget it. <laughs> I don't have anything. I'm fucking drinking water. I know. I'm what dr- the hell? I'm drinking non-alcoholic Prosecco. That is worse. I know. In the Jamming the Radar scene, we get a cameo from Michael Winslow, who hopefully people recognize from Police Academy, which is hilarious. You'd probably recognize him as one of the only people of color in this movie. No, there's um, people of color later when they're in the desert. Oh, yeah. I've got that in my notes. Shit. We'll get to that. Okay. Well, Michael Winslow made a cameo, and he obviously performed all the sound effects. And Mel Brooks said that he um, estimated that Winslow saved him about a thousand bucks by letting him do his own sounds. They made poor Barf carry in all of her luggage by himself. Yeah. And he's carrying up all her luggage. Yes. Royal Highness's match luggage. She can't, she has to have it. Who else was supposed to, do you think the princess was going to take her own shit? Not at that point. She was still a spoiled princess. Okay, but I also, the, the part where she's like, I'm going to tell him off once and for all. And I'm like, bitch, you've never met. Yeah, but it's adorable. She's obnoxious. They both think that they have the other one figured out and they don't because they're, they, they're hot for each other. They just don't know it. Trope, trope, trope. The Winnebago that they're in runs out of gas and they crash land on a desert planet. Why? Oh, why? Yes. Are they carrying all of her luggage yeah. across the desert? Yeah. And when they open it up and see that what, it's her, her industrial she, size hair dryer. Yeah, she can't live without it. Okay, but then do you notice they dump the hair dryer in yeah. the sand and they continue to carry the Big thing of luggage. Yeah, they love it. Yeah, Barf is like, I could carry three or four of these things. They knew that they were going to have to use that for something to burn so that they won't be freezing when it gets cold. They thought maybe they would have to use, they could use it as like a, a shield over their heads so that they don't burn in the hot sun. Don't they pass out in the hot sun? They do, yes. But that's after they've already burned the luggage. The luggage that's metal. It's not made of metal. Of course it is. What luggage have you had that's completely made of metal? Fancy shit. Royal luggage is not made of metal. It's, I don't know, what what do they make this shit out of? Canvas? I don't know. No, not canvas peasant. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Your rich is showing. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, they go back on Spaceball 1. And uh, I love 
love, love, love this scene because this is where they go super meta and they watch the movie, Spaceballs the movie. What the hell am I looking at? When does this happen in the movie? Now. You're looking at now, sir. Everything that happens now is happening now. What happened to then? We passed then. When? Just now. We're at now now. Go back to then. When? Now. Now? Now. I can't. Why? We missed it. When? Just now. When will then be now? Soon. You know that that scene is funny. I'm not saying anything. You know who else thought that scene was funny? Mel Brooks. It's his favorite scene. I love that Mel Brooks loves his own movie. He's like, this is one of the best things I've ever done. He should. Okay, here's a problem I have with this movie. <gasps> okay, and I've thought a lot about this yeah. because it's I, I feel conflicted about it because I am not a Jewish person. Oh. And I know the person that did this movie is a Jewish person. Yes. There were so many Jewish stereotypes in this movie. It's not even stereotypes, though. It's just him is telling, he's telling his, that's his, that's his shtick. That's his thing. I know, but it's like, you know, Druish princess. Yeah. Oh, she didn't look Druish. Yeah. And then there's the comment about, you know, wanting money and. Yeah. I mean, there's just like, it's just, it's kind of constant. If you watch any, oh, um. Oh, we're going to do Black Dynamite at some point. Mm -hmm. Or like, I'm going to get you, sucker. Okay. Like, there's there's a lot of jokes in there specifically about black people. I just felt, to me, it felt excessive. To me. Well, of course, it's because you're not Jewish. But do you think Jewish people were like, ha ha, that's funny. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I'm not Jewish. I don't know. But that's every single Mel Brooks movie has that. We do get some backstory from Lone Star when they're in the desert that, as you said, he was an orphan. <laughs> they're sitting next to the bonfire and they, they, the princess and Lone Star as they're kind of church and get to know each other, get a little close and comfy and snuggly. And uh, they're almost about to kiss and then uh, Dot Matrix is like... Cock, Virgin alarm. Cock blocks them. I love actually when they're walking in the de in the hot desert and they're begging for water. That part where you, that that's when you're talking, <laughs> except for Vespa who's asking for room service. Right. <laughs> Did you not like it because it was like you? I I would not walk through the desert. I just I just die. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it crashes, you're like just fuck keep. this. I'm gonna stay in the Winnebago in the hopes that I get saved, but I ain't dying out there. Well, they're saved by the Dinks. Okay. Yeah. You have to know what my problem is with these these people. Ding ding. No. Ding 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 ding. What are they covered in? <gasps> oh no, glitter. Glitter. <laughs> oh no, that's right they are. Covered in glitter, and do they just carry <laughs> oil around with them yes. on the off chance of a robot lands in the desert? Uh, what you know? What if they're anything like the Jawas in Star Wars, which is what they're based off of? They were scavengers, so they were like they would find droids and like take them, and like so they would need to have the oil and stuff like that on the ready for whenever they would take things. And yogurt, yeah. And okay, so that's Mel Brooks's other role is yogurt. Yogurt. Yeah. What's wrong with that? It's a stupid name. No. It's a recurrent theme in this movie. Yoda yogurt. Dum dum dum. Mel Brooks is apparently, uh, he was super allergic to that paint that was all over his face. And he was like, he would constantly, he was taking Benadryl-like candy. He's even abusive to himself. Oh yeah, his knees were super fucked too because he was he was on his knees so he could be short. And he's like, I was short to begin with. Same. Yeah. Whoa. Oh, wait, sore knees? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I had something all over my face too. There wasn't glitter. <laughs> Okay, so can I tell you, Mel Brooks was really cautious about not offending uh, George Lucas. Why? Because he loved Star Wars. Mel Brooks loved Star Wars. And he even sent him like a copy of the script beforehand. He wanted to give Lucas a chance to like see the jokes and see if he wasn't offended. Why? And he didn't. He wasn't at all. Um, he liked the script. And he said the only problem or only concern he had was them using, making like toys and stuff like merchandise. Like, because they thought it was going to be too close to Star Wars. Uh, this is a very Finn-heavy episode. Speaking of the merchandising, yeah, Finn absolutely loved the flamethrower. Oh, yeah, he did. 
Dark Helmet shows up on the desert planet to try and find Princess Vespa. It's so funny. But so he, because he's, because President Scroob told him to comb the desert. So he wanted to comb the desert. This is a great sight gag. And it is easily one of the most quotable parts of the movie. Found anything yet? Nothing yet, sir. How about you? Not a thing, sir. What about you guys? We ain't found shit. Okay. So one thing this movie is lacking in yeah. is diversity in the cast. However, in this scene, yes, they have two black actors. And what are they combing the desert with? A, a pick. A pick. Yeah. Yeah. A pick. Mm-hmm. That was, but that was the point. Because they ain't found shit. <laughs> so it's okay that Mel Brooks does Jewish stereotypes because he's Jewish. Yes. But black stereotypes? Are we 100% sure that there were no black people that were writers on this? Yes, but, I looked it up. No, <laughs> nice face. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up. There's Okay, uh, what were their names? George and Wheezy. <laughs> <laughs> The Jeffersons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, well, Lone Star shows his the medallion that he wears that he doesn't know what it means. Uh, he's he's had it since he was a baby when he was dropped at the monastery as an orphan. And Yogurt is the only person who has been able to read it, but he'll only reveal what it says at the right time, and that right time is not now. Uh huh. That's handy. Yeah, it is. It makes good storytelling. He also is making Lone Star train to learn the Schwartz, kind of like Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Dark Helmet shows up to kidnap the princess, disguises himself as King Roland to, to trick the princess into coming to him. Rick Moranis is, okay, so there's a part where he's like uh, playing with the toys, playing with the dolls. He just happened to have these dolls of Lone Star and Princess Vespa. It's all meta. There's, he also had Spaceballs the movie. They had, the, they had all the merchandise for Spaceballs. Okay. Yeah, it's meta. And he had the toys, and he um, improvised that entire scene. Oh, you're meta. Is that what the cool kids are saying? Is it? I don't know. Cap. Is Mega good? <laughs> I don't think so. Manga. Mecca. Manga's a game, right? No. Manga's a type. It's, oh, is that like a comic or something? Or graphic something? Yeah. Okay. Like Jeff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, <laughs> well, Rick Moranis did that whole, <laughs> he's very meta. This is a perfect example of how I should never do any of the comic movies that we do. I'm like, what's manga? Is that like well, a game? stop screaming pro every time we do like a superhero movie. You're fast and I'm drunk. This is where President Scroob and Dark Helmet are going to try and ransom Princess Vespa from King Roland to get the combination for the air shield so they can steal their air. They bring in the doctor that did the does nose jobs for Princess Vespa. Tell me that this scene is not problematic. It's not problematic. That's a lie. Are you saying that only Jewish people get nose jobs? I'm saying that you knew from this scene what they were doing. One hundred percent. I did not connect that to like I just thought nose job. I love that on the medical chart it shows her old nose. She's just listed as Vespa, comma Princess. <laughs> So the combination to the air shield. This is dumb. Yeah. So the combination is one, two, three, four, five. That's the stupidest combination I ever heard in my life. That's the kind of thing an idiot would have on his luggage. Can I admit, I, I wonder if, I mean, I can, I think I can say this, that do you, that, you know, my Wi-Fi at home is, is Spaceballs the Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. And that the password is Brooks was here one two three four five. Oh man, a Shawshank, re- Shawshank reference too. I love that the two low rent stormtroopers just happen to be the same size as John Candy and Bill Pullman. R. I. P. Yeah, but he's not dead. <laughs> Stop. Wait, or was that for John Candy? R. I. P. Or Bill Pull- <laughs> Bill Pullman's not dead. Lots of death in this movie. Bill Pullman and Bill Paxton are two separate people. Prove it. They just the the, the stormtroopers just happen to be the same size as Lone Star and Barf. Yeah, it's it's a this is a comedy, you know. Oh my god. 
the guy that is the um the, the one that John Candy takes his clothes from, we've seen him in things. Mm-hmm. You know what? I think he's in Groundhog Day. I think he's one of the the guys that they get drunk with or whatever. And uh, pro, <gasps> you bitch! No, you can't do that. You just saw it for like the first time last year, and I loved it. I feel like you just slapped me across the face mm-hmm. with a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I think that's the guy. <laughs> I know so much about that movie too. Do you know who the other person is? That's 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 Rick Overton, who was also in Willow, by the way. He's one of the brownies. Wait. Okay. Oh my God! Circle, circular. Um, speaking of Groundhog Day, when they have like the you know you capture their stunt doubles when they're running away. Do you know who the captain of the guard is? Yes, the guy who keeps he keeps running into. Bing! Yeah. Ben Ryerson is Stephen Tobolowsky. I love him. Aww. We're talking about good character actors. I know. I can't wait to talk about it. God damn it. Can so, we talk about how stupid this ship turning into a gigantic maid is? That is so funny. It's a transformer. It's a mega maid with a gigantic vacuum. And that's how they're going to suck all the air out. Yeah. And then they go, suck, suck, suck. 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 But then they, they're able to get the switch switched. Uh, because of the Schwartz, and they go from suck to blow. This movie went from suck to blow. Oh! <gasps> you really feel that way? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're the worst liar. <laughs> well, <laughs> Lone Star and the crew board Spaceballs 1, and they find the self-destruct button. And so Lone Star goes to set it off, and he sees Dark Helmet, and uh, uh, he has a really great line. He's like, Helmet! At last, we meet for the first time for the last time. It's so funny. They just can't avoid phallic symbols and phallic jokes in this. I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. Yeah. Oh, God. They have a little dick battle. Yeah, that was fun. A dick laser battle. That was fun to watch with Finn. Oh, I bet he thought it was a riot. (laughs) He did. (laughs) Because he's eight. Right. Well, eight. Again, Mel Brooks said it was for kids. I, you know, when I was watching this, I was, you know, typing up my notes and I knew that the part was coming up where Dark Helmet was like, I am your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. I'm like, I, I, had, the, I had the smuggest look on my face. I'm like, I don't even need to hear it. I know this is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. Now you. And what does that make us? Absolutely nothing. I love this movie. It's fine. It's it's funny, isn't it? Mm-mm. Sounded like you thought it was funny. No. This is where they have their dick laser battle. You can see um, Lone Star's stunt double really easily in several of the parts in the fight scene. Well, I mean, you saw his stunt double earlier in it, so that was, it's, that's... It was not on purpose. Do you want to hear a real take? Uh-oh. Yeah. The Spaceballs song sucks. Oh! <gasps> You look like you're serious. Space balls and space balls. Yeah. Lazy. When, when you're having a trouble in head here. Space balls. You remember every fucking line to this movie and you can't say one goddamn word from the song except for space balls. Where the space balls. That was three. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> no, I had to count it too. You know what? I started losing confidence in my math halfway into that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, before they before they set up the self destruct though, Dark Helmet says one of my absolute favorite lines of all time. I swear to God. Now you see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. You would think that. Lone Star sets off the self destruct and it's time to evacuate the ship. And you know. Um, all the different people leaving the ship, like the, there's the pizza guy and there's a clown or a bearded woman. And yeah, there's like a circus and, and zoo and pizza. This is, I gotta say Spaceballs one seems like a fucking blast. They have a zoo, they have a circus, they have pizza. What more do you want? You know, if they can get all this stuff, why do they have to steal air? Because they used up all their air. Mm-hmm. With all of their people, like the zoo and the circus and the. Uh-huh. So I'm pizza. sorry, it doesn't sound like they use their resources very well. They don't deserve air. Like a huge chunk of the budget went to post production for this movie. 
Oh, like editing and stuff? Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, all of the post-production, like sound effects and all that kind of stuff. And the reason is that Brooks wanted this to look really good and he wanted it to look similar to Star Wars. So he's like, maybe I should just get the Star Wars people. So he actually was able to, uh, he got cooperation from Lucasfilm and booked their services for post-production. So he got um, ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, did uh, did all their post-production work. They supplied the escape pod launch sequence clip, which because it was an unused clip from Star Wars. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. And another, um, and they did other effects and stuff as well. Well, you know what? And actually, later in the movie, um, when they're at this diner, and we'll go over that. You know, when it gets to that, you can see the Millennium Falcon. Oh, I didn't notice that. They put that in there. Okay. Yeah, that was neat. Um, so they blow up Spaceballs One and bring the princess and Dot back to her home planet so that she can marry Prince Valium. Stupid name. It's Prince Valium? It's like Prince Valiant. Oh, that's clever. They make him sleepy. How? What's the correlation between Valiant and boring as fuck? Valiant and Valium sound the same. This is a parody movie. What were you, What exactly are you hoping but for? But they're completely different things. Yeah? It's, it's a parody on the name, not their personality traits. <sighs> Your personality traits a parody. It said it hurt me right here <laughs> in, in my soul hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Prince Valium is played by Jim J. Bullock. From Hollywood Squares? I knew you were going to know that. We know that. Do you remember where he was in Hollywood Squares? I do. He's, he's the top left. Yep. <laughs> he was top left. I think maybe he moved around a little bit, but I always remember him being a top left. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so Lone Star and Barf take off, and they go to the diner. I like how Barf sexually assaults one of the waitresses with his tail. He can't help it. It says that this thing has a mind of its own. He's not trying to. How many times has has Reese's tail, like, smacked me in the face? Probably a lot. I have a question. Why is your face next to my dog's ass? I don't know. Why is your dog always on the couch? Because he loves you. Yeah. So, you, you know what? I'm okay with it. I love having recent read, but it just means I'm going to get, you know, tail whipped <laughs> on, on occasion. I love the diner scene because they don't end up eating because John Hurt shows up and he has a face hugger burst out of his chest again like what happened to him in Alien. I don't. Come on. I don't remember. You don't? Are you sure? Because mm. it's a really great scene. Mm-mm. Because the face hugger like bursts out of him. He's like, oh no, not again. And then he uh, puts on a top hat and he sings, Hello, my baby. <laughs> like Michigan J. Frog from the Oak. <laughs> Hello, my baby. Hello, my darling. <laughs> my rock time girl. I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> hey, look. Hello, my baby. <laughs> Hello, my darling. <laughs> Hello, my rock time girl. <laughs> so they leave the diner but of course they didn't eat because they saw the face hugger and they're like check please and they're so hungry so they open up the fortune cookie oh yeah yogurt gave them a fortune cookie earlier <laughs> Forgot to mention that. he's like don't eat it you'll find out you'll know when it's right so they open it up and then uh yogurt reveals that lone star is actually a prince what that that medallion he has is a, a royal birth certificate and that means he can turn around and go back to the planet and marry the princess which is exactly what they do where do they get the fancy clothes at the prince depot oh my god it's on it's next to the diner uh-huh it the, the, the diner is part of a strip mall Hey, guess what? What? Movie's over. Woo! It's done. Yes, it's over now. You did so great. That was hard. I can't believe you didn't. I didn't have to push the button once. No. Damn it. It, it really is a delightful movie. It is. I do think if you put 12,000 puns in a movie, not all of them are going to land. Yeah. So everything I said was just low-hanging fruit. Because yeah. some, some of the puns didn't land. Some of them were like, okay. Yeah, some of them landed then, but not now. Right. They, just, they just don't hold up great. But, but every other line was a pun. I think the fact that this movie was Princess Vespa's and 
Daphne Lone Zadiga. Star- yeah, one of their early movies. They are great in this. They really, really are. And Daphne Zuniga, she is she is a delight. She did um, uh, was on Melrose Place. I didn't watch it. She mm-hmm. was on One Tree Hill. I didn't watch it. Um, but I know you know she did. She's done many many things. And Bill Pullman was really terrific on it. And he is still alive. Mm, he is still alive. Bill Paxton is not. It's never the assholes that die. I know. It's unfair. I loved doing Space Balls. I'm so glad we did this. And I'm very glad I didn't have to attack it because I don't think I could have done well. It was tough. I had to keep watching it over and over again <laughs> to try to find... To pick pick things apart? Yeah. You did a solid job. I got to tell you. Thanks. I, if I could ask people to to weigh in on something i want to know what your favorite parody is Mm -hmm. the one that people are really loving right now is the Kristen bell one on netflix uh, with like something the woman in the window with the it's supposedly a really good parody i love her i do too oh can i mention that i am almost completely through the entire show of The Good Place. So I want to give a shout out to our good friend Holly, who suggested yeah. that I watch it. She had talked about it from an earlier episode that we had recorded, and so and I binged it like immediately. Oh, Holly's awesome. Yeah, she is. That was, and it's a really great show. So thanks for that. We would love to hear from you. We always love hearing from people. You can get a hold of us on Split Happens Pod on all of the socials at splithappenspod.com. On Tuesdays, we release our chapter titles, which is how um, we divide up the movie to take our notes. Anna comes up with chapter titles each time. And so we, we put the chapter titles out on our Facebook page and Instagram. And if you can figure out which movie we're doing, we will send you the episode a day early. Yeah, this was amazing. I am so glad we got to do this, even on location. It's really, really neat and kind of different. Well, this was great. Bye, everybody. Bye.